Well, hey, folks, did a victimized ice cream truck driver turn vigilante? This guy was shot four times by robbers who stole $12 from him back in 2010. During his recovery, prosecutors say he turned into a killer. Is this guy being falsely accused or did he really do it? Hello everybody and welcome to Profiling Evil. We're going to be talking about a case today that's been hanging around so long it's now considered Hillsborough County, Florida's longest running murder case. I hope you'll hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell so you get all our videos as we release them here on Profiling Evil. Now thankfully we're not talking about Alec Murdoch. But we're back to covering some of the other crazy cases that are happening around the world and here in the United States. Thanks for your support of Profiling Evil, folks, and for considering joining our channel memberships. Make sure you check out the Academy level. It's my favorite. Now, this case takes us back to the early months of 2010 when Michael Keatley was going about his daily routine driving his ice cream truck through the neighborhoods of Tampa, Florida. He was peddling ice cream to children in the community, just like when I was a kid. And I'm having flashbacks of my childhood and hearing that ice cream man creepy music. Holy cow, I remember the anticipation I had as I heard the sound in the distance and it slowly neared the street where I lived. I mean, it was more than a little six-year-old kid in a blue-collar neighborhood could stand. Now, if you were like me, the real pressure hit once the ice cream guy stopped when you ran out into the street with your 25 cents in your hand and tried to buy something. And you saw that myriad of choices up on the little chalkboard <laughs> that creepy guy leaning out the window of the van waiting to see what you wanted. Anyway, I'm digressing here. Let's go back to that day in 2010 as Keatley was traveling the streets of Tampa with his music coursing across the community while he sold his ice cream. Suddenly, this guy is attacked by a group of men who rob him and then they shoot him four times, leaving the guy for dead. In all, the Predator stole a total of $12 from the ice cream vendor. Now, Keatley spent the next 10 months working through some painful recovery as he not only endured physical pain, but the emotional trauma that associated it with that murder attempt. His frustration mounted as law enforcement failed to make an arrest in his case, and according to prosecutors, he became so frustrated that he began to investigate the case himself. Now, prosecutors are arguing that his angry focus became motive for murder. His case was first bound over for trial in 2020. And now, this accused killer had spent more than 10 years in jail before he was taken to that first trial. More than 10 years, never faltering from his claim that he was innocent and that he was being set up. Well, when his case went to trial, the jury couldn't make a decision. They were divided. Ten thought he was guilty. Two people didn't believe he was. They could not accept the fact that this guy pulled the trigger. And that led to waiting a few more years till his trial could be reheard, which it's now underway. If they find him not guilty, the state better be prepared to pay this guy and compensate him for holding him in jail for that long. Holy smokes. Well, Keatley claims he physically could not do what law enforcement said he did. That's pull a trigger multiple times. Now, his reason? Keatley says he was permanently disabled, his right hand especially, when he was shot those four times, and that he doesn't shoot left-handed. Throughout the new trial, though, he's never used his right hand. In fact, when he adjusts his sweater, He's always doing it with his left hand. And I think that's part of the strategy to make it look like this arm is just of no use, nor is his hand. He thinks it's proof that he didn't do it. 
I'm going to play the prosecution's opening statements at the end of this video so you can see in a nutshell what they're going to use as evidence and you decide whether in fact he was the killer of two brothers who were known as Magic and Spider by their friends. Now the prosecution shows evidence of a notebook that was owned by Keatley where he recorded the address where the actual shootings occurred and the names of people suspected, people that he thought were the suspects who shot him uh, many years earlier in that uh, ice cream truck robbery. It appears that there might be some question about whether the men shot were actually the suspects or not. Many people saying they were not. I'm going to leave that also up to you to decide. In reality, I don't think it matters. That even all he went through doesn't permit him that far later to go in and shoot these guys. Now, prosecutors say that Keatley arrived at the scene sometime around 2 a.m. driving a dark van. He exited the vehicle wearing a t-shirt with the word sheriff printed across the chest. He uh, appeared to act like he was a cop and he brandished a long gun which he aimed at the men demanding to know which one was named Creeper. He was convinced Creeper was the shooter in his case. He demanded their identification and most of them complied but when one didn't he was shot and killed. Well, the survivors of the attack took the stand and one in particular identified Keatley as the man that tried to kill them and in fact killed two of them. Four others were injured in that shooting. To argue that it couldn't have been Keatley, the defense put on Keatley's surgeon who again testified that injuries to his right hand from that armed robbery years earlier made it impossible for him to pull the trigger. Well, that doesn't explain a couple of really important things that I want you to consider. First, the shell casings that were recovered at the murder scene. There was also a shell casing recovered at Keatley's residence that had the exact forensic information on it that the, the casings at the crime scene had. That's going to be a tough hill for Keatley to climb. Now, this became a topic of discussion this morning with Ted Rollins on Court TV. So I want to take a moment and let's listen. And then I hope you'll take a moment and enter your thoughts down below about this guy who took on a Mr. Rogers look through this trial. In fact, if you saw my thumbnail, sweater after sweater he comes into court wearing. Let's watch. Uh, and also with us... Retired police commander and host of Profiling Evil, Mike King. He's in San Antonio. We got the Texas guys with us this morning. Mike, what's your thought uh, overall in this case from what you've seen and, and read about? It, it, you know, last time it was 10-2. The jury voted to acquit. It was a hung jury. Um, and now here we are three years later with basically the same set of circumstances, same evidence. Where's the state here? Well, I think the state's in a good position because they've come back. They obviously think they have enough information to carry the ball this time. I would hope, Ted, that they also figured out in that interim period how to fix the holes that were created that caused 10 people to say, no, we don't think this guy's guilty. Uh, I agree with John that, I, I mean, I, I, I think it was really smart to put this guy in a sweater. He just looks like a a nice guy sitting there and it's going to be really hard for him even with that look even with that appeal of the ice cream guy to get over the fact that there is some pretty powerful forensic evidence that that uh, is going to be hard for him to get over and uh, also there's going to be some circumstantial evidence like things like the shirt he was wearing in a in a party versus at the crime scene and uh, and the testimony is pretty compelling of the victims in this case yeah we saw that yesterday play out there was, yesterday was the day where people who have been watching the trial uh, may have said oh now I get why the state of Florida thinks this, the ice cream man did it, because uh, you had that notebook with the uh, creeper's name in it, and then the street where the murders took place. He's written down Ocean Mist in his notebook found at home, uh, along with the flyer for um, help, lo looking for help to solve his 
crime, the one where he was the victim. Well, Ted and I then chatted about the lead detective's testimony and the state's theory that Keatley was so frustrated with the lack of investigative progress in the case that he finally took justice into his own hands. I don't know how you feel about this. Some of you might feel like it was the right thing to do, but it did go too far. Let's listen. Mike, it's a different. It was a difficult thing for the defense because there was actual testimony from the lead detective at some point where um, he said, "Yeah, I was retiring in June. I took uh, one statement. Really didn't do much in this case. That was basically his testimony." But the defense can't jump on that and say, "Look, yeah, he was mad because now you're hanging your your guy." But you also want the jury to know that in case there's a nullifier on there, a, a juror that's that, that does side with him saying I would have done the same thing. Well, yeah, I mean, the, the people are really frustrated right now, and I don't know, we've seen kind of a meanness across the country as well, where people are feeling like I've got to take justice into my own hands rather than be patient and wait for a system which sometimes clunks along pretty darn slowly. But uh, this, this is why it's so important that the prosecution come out and say very clearly, no, we believe that these were the steps that were taken. This is this ramp up period, this anger that was brewing and, and, uh, and there was all this planning that occurred and, uh, and then put together the old basics of, of means, motive and opportunity. And I think, it will convince the jury this time. Yeah, it's going to be a nail biter. This one, uh, this was last time too. Now remember, folks, Keatley was shot four times when he was robbed back in 2010. One of those bullets pierced his right hand, and again, that's what the defense attorneys are saying keeps him from being the trigger puller. Do you buy it? <laughs> you know, one thing that I found interesting as I watched this trial unfold is that Keatley most of the time seems pretty dang bored. Maybe after you've sat in jail for so many years, you've gone through two trials and you've reheard the same testimony over again, you think maybe like he's thinking, I've heard it all. I don't know, but what do you think about that? I want you to put your comments down below. And remember, folks, you can watch the entire opening statement from the prosecution at the end of this video. So it'll be after the little uh, Profiling Evil trailer plays out. For now, I hope you'll take a moment and hit that like and subscribe button and ring the bell and join the Profiling Evil family. Make sure that you're entering your comments on this one below about whether you think Michael Keatley's going to be found guilty or not guilty at the end of this trial. And, and then I want you to take a moment and tell me what you think the impact is of the physical, the forensic, and the circumstantial evidence. And finally, where do you put those eyewitness accounts, the victims who survived that shooting? Did they really see Michael Keatley? Was he really carrying a weapon and firing it? Or have they fingered the wrong guy. Hey, please remember, you can find Profiling Evil on your favorite podcast platform if you're into audio podcasts. And watch for us on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and of course, uh, Facebook. So please take a moment, visit our webpage at profilingevil.com and make sure you're signed up for the uh, BOLO. BOLO stands for Be On The Lookout. And it's our digital newsletter. We only publish it a couple of times a year. And I promise you, we don't sell your information to anybody else. We'll only use it for that bolo when it comes out periodically. Hey, folks, thanks for your support of Profiling Evil. And we'll see you all soon at the next crime scene. May it please the court, defense counsel. <clears throat> Members of the jury, it is the night before Thanksgiving. <clears throat> the year is 2010, and there is a small group of friends and family gathering at another friend's house, the Lucas House. It's located in Ruskin, 604 Ocean Mist Court. 
They're there because it's the day before Thanksgiving. They don't have to work the next day. You'll hear that some of them were there most of the night. They're there playing cards. They're drinking. They're hanging out with their friends. You'll hear because it was Thanksgiving the next day, they didn't have to work, so they were there late. They were there after midnight. It becomes the early morning hours of Thanksgiving, November 25th of 2010. And they are still out there on that day when the defendant, Michael Keatley, comes over to the Lucas home posing as a law enforcement officer with a loaded 45 caliber gun. He gets out of his dark blue van, he approaches that porch, and they're all still gathered there, and he is acting like a law enforcement officer. The witnesses have described that he is wearing a black shirt with the word sheriff in white on his chest, and that he has a firearm, and that he's demanding that he is looking for somebody named Creeper. Where's Creeper? Who's Creeper? He's demanding that they show him their identification. Where's your IDs? And he is ordering all of them to get on the ground, to lay down, to look towards the house. And you will hear that they try to comply with that, that they actually do get on the ground, that some of them try to get their identification. But he doesn't wait to see who they are. He doesn't wait to identify them. He immediately, intentionally, and systematically starts shooting them, one by one, one after the, after the other, six victims in this case. He is in close proximity to them, less than a few feet away, when he starts firing that loaded 45 caliber firearm. He kills two of the victims. Juan and Sergio Guitron, brothers, both of them died that night. He tried to kill four other victims in this case, Daniel Beltran, Richard Cantu, Gonzalo Guevara, and Raymond Galan. All of them that night were in fear for their lives because this man wanted vengeance. He continued to fire his firearm until they stopped moving, until they were bleeding on that porch. That is first degree premeditated murder for the two victims that he killed, and that is attempted first degree murder for the four victims that he tried to kill. We will prove this case beyond all reasonable doubt through eyewitness testimony through physical evidence that was collected at the scene and at the defendant's residence that directly tie him to this crime. We will prove it through forensic evidence, through ballistics, through the firearms. There were shell casings and projectiles that were collected from the scene that are, lo that are linked to projectiles and casings that are collected from the defendant's residence and from another witness who had collected some casings from his residence. And we will prove this through forensic evidence, through expert testimony. You'll hear about a computer download that links the defendant to this crime. The eyewitness testimony. You are going to hear from all four surviving victims in this case. They will come in here and they will take the stand and they will tell you the worst night that they survived. You will hear from Daniel Beltran. You will hear that he, on that Thanksgiving, that day before Thanksgiving, met up with his good friend, Juan Gutron, and that they decided, because they didn't have to work the next day, because it was Thanksgiving, that they would get together. And they were in front of the Lucas house at the time, and they said, well, why don't we just go play cards there? And so they both, after they worked, went and showered, and they met back up. And you will hear that they were later joined by all of those victims that I have mentioned. And another victim, Jose Rodriguez, who was not shot but was on that porch and is the only one who did not receive life-threatening injuries that day. 
You will hear from Daniel Beltron that when they were hanging out, that they were drinking. They were also doing drugs. You're going to hear that there was marijuana and that some of them were also using cocaine, that somebody brought cocaine to that party. And he will admit to you that he did all of those things. He drank some beers, he smoked some marijuana, and he used some cocaine. <coughs> He'll admit to ingesting it, to using a key and snorting it. But he will tell you that he will never forget what happened to him even 10 years later. He remembers the incident vividly. And he will tell you that when the defendant approached and demanded who Creeper was, that one of his friends and demanded that they get their IDs, said it's in the car and tried to go get it from the car. And the defendant immediately started shooting at them. He saw Richard Cantu in front of him get shot in the head and fall. He will tell you that they were trying to get on the ground, that they actually were on the ground, unarmed and defenseless, when they were all being shot by the defendant. After he saw his friend Richard Cantu get shot, and another one of his friends get shot, he is facing the house. He can't really see who is shooting him or who's shooting at them because he's looking at the house. He'll say that after he saw Richard Cantu get shot in the head, he realized he had to try to get away. And he does. When he gets up to run, he is shot in his backside, and that bullet goes straight into his leg. And he's having a hard time running. He says that he can't get away quick enough when the defendant is then shooting him in the chest. At some point, the defendant shoots at him, and it misses, and it hits a window. The shot that gets him in the chest throws him off of the porch. And after he's thrown off the porch, he said the defendant continues to try to shoot at him. He is trying to crawl, trying to get away on the side of that house, that trailer. He's trying, I'm sorry, that house. He's trying to get around it. He's bleeding. He's been shot four times, and he is so afraid because he is still hearing gunshots that he wants to get away from there. But there is a six-foot privacy fence in that backyard. He tries to get over it and breaks the top of the fence. He takes a chair and props it up against the fence, and he is somehow able to get over that fence. You will see photographic evidence that was taken by law enforcement. And you will see that the evidence that is collected on scene corroborates Daniel Beltran's account. You will see shell casings that are on that porch. You will see blood on that porch. You will see evidence of medical intervention from EMS when they came to treat the victims. And you will see his identification on the side of that porch, his ID that he tried to get out, but dropped when he was fleeing for his life. He left it there. You'll see photographs of the back of that fence. It is broken. You'll see a photograph of a chair propped up on the back of that fence. And right where it's propped up, you will see blood on that fence from when he hurled himself over that fence. You're also going to hear from law enforcement officers that responded and saw all of these victims shot on the porch. And Deputy McMurtry, one of the first responding officers, will tell you that yes, while he was on scene, while he was counting and trying to aid and get assistance for all of these victims on the porch, another deputy alerts him that there was another victim that was driven back that had been shot and got away. You will hear from Raymond Galan, another victim that watched his friends and his family get shot in front of him and next to him. And he was shot as well in the stomach. All of the victims that were shot 
had life-threatening injuries and had to be transported to the hospital. You will hear from Gonzalo Guevara, I'm sorry, Gonzalo Guerra. He was shot four times that night. He was taken to the hospital. You'll also hear from Richard Cantu. All of these victims in this case remember this horrific night vividly. All of them do, except for Richard Cantu. He cannot remember the details of that night at all because the defendant shot him in the back of his head and because of the injuries that he sustained, he has no recollection of that night. We talked about expert testimony. <clears throat> You're going to hear from Dr. Mainland, the medical examiner in this case. She is the one that performed the autopsies on Juan and Sergio Guitron. She will tell you that she performed the autopsy and what their injuries were and what the cause and manner of death and where they were shot, where the entrance wounds were and what the exit wounds were. She actually responded to 604 Ocean Mist Court because one of the victim's injuries were so severe <laughs> that he died at that location. Sergio Gatron had one gunshot wound that went in through his left arm and then entered in his, to his chest and pierced his heart, his lungs, and his pulmonary artery. He had no chance. He died of those gunshot wounds, and he died right there on that porch. You'll hear that Juan Gatron actually was transported to the hospital and died there. And she will tell you that both of his entrance wounds are to the back shot not once but twice while he was on his back trying to comply with his orders. Get on the ground, show me your ID. She will tell you that he sustained massive blood loss, that there was extreme damage to his internal organs. His liver, his kidneys, his lungs were all damaged by those two gunshot wounds to his back. The evidence in this case will prove beyond all reasonable doubt that this was premeditated, that the defendant committed these murders and these attempted murders <laughs> after consciously deciding to do so, that he drove to that location, that he dressed and pretended to be a law enforcement officer. He brought a loaded firearm and he continued to fire at victims in close proximity until they could not move. The evidence will also prove beyond all reasonable, reasonable doubt that it is the defendant that committed these crimes. Gonzalo Guerra, he's not able to give a statement to law enforcement on scene. He is taken to the hospital and he has serious medical issues. He's shot four times in the hand, in the chest, in the stomach, <laughs> and he is receiving treatment. And you'll hear that the case detective in this case, Detective Jose Lugo with the Sheriff's Office, is trying to take a statement, is trying to see whether or not any of the victims can identify the defendant. And the first time he goes out there, Gonzalo Guerra is in no condition to make an identification. You're going to hear that a photo pack is compiled with the defendant's photograph in it, that it contains other photographs of other individuals, all with the same ethnic background, all white individuals, that looks somewhat similar, so not to be suggestive, and that when he goes back a few days after this crime has occurred, 
and he makes sure that Gonzalo is understanding him, that the medication, he asks him questions to make sure that he's lucid, that he understands what's going on, and he shows him this photo pack. And he gives the victim, Mr. Guerra, instructions. And you will hear at this time, he is still being treated. He is still being monitored. He has machines connected to him that monitor his heart rate, his blood pressure, his breathing. And when Detective Lugo shows this victim the photo pack, Gonzalo Guerra the photo pack, he will tell you when he gets to the defendant's photo that he immediately identifies him. He says he is 2,000 percent sure. Detective Lugo is making observations of the victim. He's watching him. He will tell you that the machine that is monitoring him immediately goes off because not only is he identifying him, he is having a physical and emotional response to a face that he will never forget. He sees him start to tear up. He sees the issues with his, that his breathing, that is, he is 2,000% sure that the photograph of that defendant is the person that murdered his friends and shot at him. The judge is going to read you jury instructions and he will tell you all of the elements that we have to prove, both for first degree murder and for first degree attempted murder. He's gonna read you all the elements. What he'll never tell you that we have to prove is motive. We don't ever have to prove why. But in this case, you will get overwhelming evidence of motive. You will know why the defendant did exactly what he did. It will be uncontradicted that back in January 23rd of 2010, 11 months before these horrific crimes, the defendant tragically was a victim himself. He was robbed and shot at gunpoint. He was an ice cream truck driver. He was over in the Ruskin area, Sun City area. That was his route. And on January 23rd of 2010, he was in his truck when his car alerted him, honked his horn, he stopped his car, his truck, his ice, it's actually a van, it's a purple van, he stopped it, and a young female came up to the truck and she asked, she put in an order, and as she, he's trying to talk with her, immediately two masked men who are armed, faces covered with ski masks, with guns, rob him. It's worse than that. Not only do they rob him, and I think it's a very small amount, $12, they shoot him. He knows that they're going to shoot him and there is a struggle in the van and he is shot multiple times. And those three people get away. He is able to drive down the street about four houses down and get help. You will hear that the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office responds to that location. Deputy McMurtry responds to that location. He's one of the first officers, the first deputies on scene. And he sees Michael Keatley seated in the driver's seat of that ice cream van and he's bleeding. He needs immediate medical treatment. The ambulance responds within minutes and starts to give treatment. And that first responding officer just gets some very brief information, very general information. It is a young black female, two black males. He doesn't conduct a long interview with Mr. Keatley because Mr. Keatley requires medical treatment. He is taken to the hospital. And when you have an armed robbery case, there is going to be a case detective that is assigned to investigate it. And in Mr. Keatley's case, it is Detective Roy Nolan, who is now retired from the Sheriff's Office. 
But back on January, in January of 2010, he was working at the sheriff's office and he actually responded out to the hospital to meet with the defendant, to get as much information as he could to try to find who did this to Mr. Keatley. You will hear that he got a description, young black female and two young black males. And he gives a description of a car, a Buick, a white Buick, Buick, 90 model. And that, unfortunately, is all the information that Mr. Keatley can provide to him because they were wearing ski masks. One of them, he said, was wearing gloves. The sheriff's office processed that van for evidence. They processed it for fingerprints, potential fingerprints, for DNA. They collected casings that were left. Detective Nolan will tell you what he did to try to solve that case, even though he didn't have much to go on. And during the time while he was at the sheriff's office, there wasn't any real leads that ever developed. But he kept in contact with the defendant. He will tell you that he spoke to him maybe three or four more times after this homicide, I'm sorry, attempted rob, rob, after this robbery, armed robbery happened, and that they were just general conversations over the phone where Mr. Keatley was asking if there were any updates, and unfortunately, he did not have any updated information. But he will also tell you at some point during these phone conversations, the defendant was telling him he was back in his ice cream truck doing those same routes and trying to get information. He even asked Detective Nolan at some point, um, provided him and asked him about some Hispanic names. But never once to Detective Nolan did the defendant ever change his identification that this was a young, or description, not identification, description that this was a young black female and two black males. He never once gave Detective Nolan any indication that he might have been wrong with that description. We will be able to establish that the defendant started investigating his case, that this is a case that the motive for this case simply is revenge, retaliation. He wanted to shoot the people who shot him. And he became obsessed with finding the individuals who did this. You will hear about the Sheriff's Office investigation and that they immediately took a statement from Jose Rodriguez, who was able to tell them Again, that the person who did this, who committed those homicides and attempted homicides, was asking for Creeper, that that is some of the information that they had in this case, and that they started to conduct interviews of people who know Michael Keatley and know that he was looking for somebody by the name of Creeper. And there actually is an individual who lives on Ocean Mist, who, go by, who goes by the name Creep, or Creeper. <clears throat> Daniel Beltran knew who Creeper was. He knew that that was Omar Bayon. In fact, when those demands happened that night, he was thinking about pointing out the house, but others were saying, we don't know, and he never had the opportunity to say that this is not the house where Omar Bayon lives. You will hear that law enforcement talked to Omar Bayon and that Omar Bayon is not a black male. He is Hispanic and he does go by that name Creeper or Creep and that he lives on Ocean Mist with his family. But he doesn't live on 604 Ocean Mist. He lives on 507 Ocean Mist. And he was not on that porch on Thanksgiving Day morning in 2010 when the defendant shot 
all of those victims. Law enforcement located a woman by the name of Norma Jean Towers. Woman that does not know the victims in this case. Who does she know? The defendant. She knew him before he was shot in January of 2010. And she continued to know him. She actually started dating him after he was shot on January 23rd of 2010. And she will tell you at some point while they were seeing one another, he actually drove her out to the area close to where his robbery and shooting happened and asked her to start taking down license plates and descriptions of vehicles something that scared her a little bit because he wanted to find out who shot him. He was not happy with the sheriff's office investigation. She will also tell you that he bought a 20, I'm sorry, a 45 caliber gun sometime in August and September of 2010, a few months before the defendant brought that 45 caliber gun to Ocean Miss Court. You will hear from another individual, Stacy Rogan, who knows the defendant. She had known that he had been robbed and shot, and when she ran into him, he was looking for a person named Creeper. This is the person he believed who shot him. She said at some point, he called her, and said, or no, I'm sorry, when they met, he said to call him if she ever ran into a Hispanic man with a tattoo of Creeper or somebody who went by the name of Creeper. Second person who knew the defendant was looking for Creeper, doing his own investigation. Brianna Gregory, another person who met the defendant after he was shot. She happened to meet him at a bar. He told her what happened to him, that he had been robbed, that he had been shot, and that he was looking for who had done this. At some point, she sees him on more than one occasion. I believe she sees him on two times. Two times she runs into him. And the second time, he is asking her if she knows or has seen somebody by the name of Creeper. She did not. She did not know who that was. She also runs into him at a Halloween party in October of that year, and it is a costume party. And she runs into him, and it's just a, it's not a, she has a conversation with him. She's there with other friends, and she just happens to take a photograph with the defendant. And law enforcement tracks down that photograph, and you will see that his costume is a black shirt with white lettering that says police on it, that he had dressed up as a law enforcement officer. He's wearing a black shirt with lettering that identified him as a law enforcement officer and that he had a gun belt on his host, on a gun belt as part of his costume. You will also hear from David Beckworth. He actually was hired by the defendant after the defendant was robbed to kind of be security, to kind of go with him in that ice cream truck to carry a 45 caliber gun because the defendant was afraid. He wanted some additional protection. And David Beckworth will tell you at some point the defendant talked about getting a cop car that he wanted to make the people who shot him disappear. Another individual that met with the defendant after he was a victim, who knew that the defendant was trying to find the people who did this to him. You will hear by a person named Johnny Sanchez, who also knew the defendant. And the defendant also asked him if he knew someone by the name of Creeper. The defendant did more than just ask people 
if they knew Creeper did more than just looking for people, I'm sorry, looking for people who knew Creeper, the defendant actually went and confronted somebody in that community of shooting him. And it was not Omar Bayon, the person that we know is Creeper, but somebody by the name of Armando Guerra. Mr. Guerra's uncle lives on Ocean Mist, and the defendant approached Armando Guerra while he was at his uncle's house and accused him, showed him his injuries, said that he was shot, and accused him of being the one that shot him. To which Armando Guerra told him, I did not shoot you. He used a little bit different language, but you'll hear from Mr. Guerra himself. And you will hear that the defendant said that he was under surveillance. So the defendant is so obsessed with finding out who shot him that he's actually out there not only doing his own investigation, he's actually accusing people of doing this to him. You're going to hear that the defendant was developed very quick, pretty soon within this investigation as the person who was looking for Creeper, and that he is stopped by law enforcement, by members of the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. And he stopped driving this, a dark blue Chevy van. The victims in this case, the surviving victims, Daniel Beltran describes a dark colored van as the vehicle that that person, that the killer drove to their house. Gonzalo Guerra describes a dark colored van. These witnesses saw that this was a dark colored van. You will hear that the law enforcement officers, detectives in this case, the case detective Jose Lugo and Detective Schramm, interviewed the defendant, that he volunteered for an interview, that that interview is recorded. And you're actually going to hear those recordings. Um, you actually are going to hear that he gave two recordings. You're going to hear those in reverse. There are a lot of witnesses in this case. And some of those witnesses, because of scheduling, are going to be taken out of order. We're going to try to present as much of the case to you chronologically, but because of so many witnesses and scheduling, you're actually going to hear the second interview in time first, but you are also going to hear the first interview. You're just going to hear them out of order. You're going to hear in the defendant's own voice that he adamantly denies, he never admits that he is the killer in this case. And you're going to hear the entire recording that the defendant, both recordings the defendant gives to law enforcement. But the evidence in this case will prove the defendant lied and lied and lied in both of those interviews. Defendant said he didn't do it. He's very adamant. He never admits those are lies. It will be clear to you beyond all reasonable doubt that he is the person who did this. One of the things he tells those detectives with the sheriff's office is because they know they they know that that person was looking for a creeper. They know he's been shot. It was their office that did that investigation. He says he doesn't know what they're talking about. They're saying creeper. You were looking for creeper. He denies ever knowing or ever hearing of somebody named Creeper. He knows that these victims are Hispanic. He keeps saying, oh, the individuals who robbed me were black. It couldn't have been me. You know that his denial of ever hearing of Creeper is a lie because you will hear from all of those witnesses that knew the defendant, that knew that he was conducting his own investigation and knew that he was looking for Creeper. You will hear in those interviews at some point, the detectives, and they, will, they employ different strategic um, information in that interview or strategic questioning um, when they are interviewing a suspect of a homicide case. They say, somebody's calling us up, telling us 
that you're looking for someone named Creeper, that you did this. And he, and ask them why, why is that? People that he knows are telling them that he's looking for Creeper and he's the one that did this. And you will hear him say, adamantly deny it wasn't him, but they just must have thought I went ballistic. You'll hear him continue to deny that he did this, but admit if it was them, that he hated them, and he's happy that they, that, that happened but he'll all the time maintain that he didn't do this. You will hear him adamantly say when they confront him, you were found in a dark blue van. That meets the description of what those victims said. And he'll say, no, I don't have a dark blue van. Mine is two-toned. Mine is blue on top and silver on the bottom. Nobody will be able to place my van at that scene. Lie after lie after lie. How do we know that that is a lie? Because you will hear from Henry Boas, who knows the defendant, who has known the defendant for a while, who paints cars. And the day after Thanksgiving, Henry Boas is contacted by the defendant. And guess what? to paint his car two-toned. He calls him on the phone. He says, do you have silver paint? Do you have paint for my car? And Henry's like, I don't have enough. You're gonna have to go buy some paint. And yeah, I'll paint your car. That's what he does. He paints cars. But because he didn't have enough paint, he's like, you can go to Napa. This is where I get my paint. And he gives him directions to the Napa paint store. And the defendant goes to the Napa paint store, he buys the paint, and then he goes directly to Henry Bowe's house. And he is there waiting for him. He's already started to remove parts of the vehicle so that this vehicle can be painted quickly. That day, the day after Thanksgiving, November 26, 2010, you will hear that the sheriff's office, detectives from the sheriff's office, tracked down that paint store, got the receipt, and were able to identify the defendant as the one buying that silver paint. Henry Bowes will tell you that the defendant helped wrap the car so that he could paint it two-toned. He is doing that to cover up evidence that he is the killer in this case. He knows his vehicle was used and he is trying to hide it. He never once tells law enforcement about the paint. He tells them that his car is two-toned, it is blue and silver, and nobody is gonna say my van was out there on Ocean Mist Court. Henry Bowes will also tell you that's a defendant, that there was all kinds of stuff in that truck he doesn't know, but the defendant continued to clean out that truck, that he filled several garbage bags. We will never know what was in those garbage bags because Henry Bowes didn't know what the defendant did and they were put out for the garbage to collect and they were picked up and taken before law enforcement could get there. And it says also in that interview, he couldn't possibly have shot or pulled a trigger because he was injured. He has sustained injuries from when he was shot. Shot in the arm, had issues with one of his arm. But he said he couldn't shoot him with both of his arms. Both, I'm sorry, both of his hands. Both of his hands were bad. Another lie that he told law enforcement, you're going to hear from Wesley Smith, Someone who knows the defendant, who was actually invited to the defendant's home to do what? Target shooting with him. The defendant had a 45 caliber gun, invited him and his wife over to the residence. There's an abandoned van on the property, and they fired his 45 multiple times just for fun, target plat for target practice. He allowed him and his wife to use the gun. And he himself shot that firearm that day. He can fire a gun. 
lie after lie after lie. You will hear about the ballistic evidence, the firearm evidence in this case, the forensic evidence in this case, the projectiles and the shell casings that are left at that scene that were collected by law enforcement. You will see the, the physical evidence that will be brought into court for you, and you will also see photographs of where they were found, where they were collected from, where on 604 Ocean Mist when this crime occurred. All of those projectiles and shell casings are collected. You will hear that a search warrant was done on the defendant's property, and that abandoned van that was shot up, that there were some projectiles recovered from that. You will hear that there is a burn area, that there are some casings recovered from that. And you will hear from Wesley Smith that him and his wife would collect casings. And the day that they shot on the property with the defendant, they collected all those casings for reloads. That's what they did after they fired and they used their ammunition semi-automatic, those casings that house the bullet are expelled, and they collected them because they will reuse them and take them to have them reloaded with ammunition so they can be used again. And you'll hear that law enforcement, when they found out that they actually still had them, they collected those, those shell casings that they collected the day that they shot at the defendant's house with the defendant's 45 caliber gun. All of that was sent to FDLE. Jennifer Clark, an expert in firearms, was able to look at those shell casings and some of the casings that came from that abandoned car. There was more than one type of, I'm sorry, van, abandoned van, projectiles that came from that abandoned van that some of the projectiles were fired from the same firearm from the casings and projectiles that were fired from the scene, as well as a casing that was recovered from a burn area from the defendant's property, and those shell casings that were collected from Wesley Smith, directly linking the murder weapon to the defendant. The murder weapon is never recovered, but based on her examination, she is able to tell that they were fired from the same gun. Directly links him to these crimes, to these homicides and attempted homicides. There was a search warrant that was conducted at his home where he lived. And you're going to hear that there was a laptop that was recovered. This laptop is sent to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. There is a download that is done. <coughs> and they can tell by, based on the download, some searches that were done. And they can tell when these terms were searched. The person on the computer was looking for these terms on his computer. And starting in March 21st of 2013, which would have been couple of months after he had been shot and robbed, he is searching for the term creeper. They can also tell you how many times he searched. He searched for the term creeper 185 times. Ocean mist. He searched for that term 92 times. Bayon. Omar Bayon, the person with the nickname Creeper, B-A-I-L-O-N. 
He searched for that term 11 times. Omar, he searched for that term 11,602 times. Magazine, 1,984 times. Uniform, 3,996 times. <coughs> Law enforcement, 22 times that term was searched on his computer. Glock, 2,353 times. <coughs> Drum magazine, 102. Th we approach? Yeah. Uh, Ms. Dory, you ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. May I please support? Yes. <laughs> Members of the jury, during that break, my esteemed co-counsel let me know there are a couple of times I misspoke, so I just want to clarify. I believe when I said um, Gonzalo Guevara, I think I misspoke and called him Gonzalo Guerra a couple of times. One of the victims that was shot and still was alive, is, his name is Gonzalo Guevara. He is the one that did the identification in the hospital. I also, um, when I was talking about Norma Jean Tower, I said that she was with him, <coughs> excuse me, when he bought a 45 caliber gun. That is not correct. I did not, <coughs> excuse me, did not mean to mislead you. She was with him when she, what he bought, what she believed were 45 caliber bullets. So I wanted to make that correction. The other um, thing, when I was talking about the search, the searches on this computer, I told you that those terms were searched March 21st of 2013. That is the search that is being performed by Florida Department of Law Enforcement. They cannot tell us when those terms were searched. We know that this computer was taken from the defendant's home in 2010, so I also wanted to make that clarification. But those numbers are correct. He was searching for Creeper 185 times because he was obsessed with finding him. He had determined in his investigation that Creeper was Omar Bayan, and those are some of the other terms that he searched. Omar 11,602 times. Bayon, B-A-L-O-N, 11 times in that computer that was recovered from his house. The same search warrant where law enforcement found that computer, they found a composition book in his house, this composition book. You'll hear that the detectives went through that composition book, and on one of those pages was written... Bayon, B-A-I-L-O-N, Omar's last name, the person who has a nickname Creeper, and an address, 507 Ocean Mist. That is where Omar Bayon lives. That is the address that the defendant had found, and that is actually Omar Bayon's address. He does live on Ocean Mist a few houses down from 604 Ocean Mist where these horrific crimes have happened. You can see that there's a little bit of redness here on this photograph. This composition book was actually dusted for fingerprints. And you're going to hear from Ricky Navarro with the Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office. He is a latent fingerprint examiner. He actually met with the defendant, enrolled his fingerprints, and he can tell you that it is the defendant, Michael Keatley's fingerprints, on this composition book where the words Bayon and 507 Ocean Miss Court are written down. This defendant wanted to shoot the same people that shot him. The evidence will be clear to you. It will be beyond all reasonable doubt that he shot six innocent people. He originally said that there were two gunmen, 
only two, two black males and a young black female. He shot six Hispanic males that had nothing to do with the very tragic crime that occurred to him. Had absolutely nothing to do with it. That's the facts in this case. The surviving victims in this case are very clear. One gunman, one gun. You'll hear that there may be some different descriptions as to what the gun looked like, but they were all very clear. One gunman posing as a law enforcement officer, demanding their IDs, ordering them on the ground. And all of the evidence in this case proves that it is the defendant, Michael Keatley, who was responsible for the killing of Sergio and Juan Gitron and for trying to kill those four victims. We are confident that, you have, that after you have heard all the evidence in this case, seen all the evidence, heard from all of the eyewitnesses, heard all of the testimony, that you will hold the defendant responsible, that you will find him guilty for the first degree attempted murder of both Jose and Juan Gatron, and for the attempted murder of the four other victims in this case.